Good evening. As a UC Santa Cruz Alumni Council member, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly speaker series, Slugs and Steins, lectures from UC Santa Cruz. I'm David Hansen. And for those of you who are new to our Slugs and Steins series, it engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in a discussion with you, the local community of the Silicon Valley and our extended community online with a goal of making us all Renaissance people. We want it to feel like you're at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with drinks and without tests. This event tonight marks the 48th consecutive month of talks. Four years, half in person, half in pandemic mode, and not one with exams or term papers. Mike, another volunteer organizer, is with me tonight. We're both alumni and spend our days in entrepreneurial companies, Silicon Valley style. He'll be helping me with the Q&A and you'll hear more from him at the end. Now, before we get started, please answer a few questions on where you are tonight and how many you're with. The poll will pop up on your screen. We'll share the results after we've given everyone a moment to respond. Okay, now you should be able to see the results of the poll. Today we raise a virtual stein with Chris Wilmers, Professor of Wildlife Conservation at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He has studied large carnivores, such as mountain lions, African lions, wolves, leopards, and bears for over 20 years, trying to understand how humans impact their behavior, ecology, populations, and conservation. Locally, Chris and his team have been investigating mountain lions in the Santa Cruz Mountains for the past 14 years. Their research is illuminating many aspects of the secretive world these animals inhabit that were previously unknown to science, as well as identifying critical habitat and land use practices essential for their continued survival. Now, if you have questions for our professor, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom, the Zoom Q&A box. We'll address questions at the end of the talk, but you don't need to wait until the last minute. Type them in at any time. Also, if you see someone else's question that you like, you can upvote it and we'll ask it sooner. This talk is being recorded. In a few days, you'll be able to find it in the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel. We'll post the link in our social media channels and follow up emails. Okay, does everyone have their sign? Great, I've got your slug, Professor Wilmers. Great, thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, my video seems to be remote, uh, stopped. Oh, there, there we go. Great, well, thank you so much everyone for coming and, and uh, thank you, David and Mike and Diana and Kayla for inviting me. Um, today, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, uh, some of the research that's going on in my lab group and um, uh, before I, I begin I always like to just thank everyone who's been involved and and this work is really you know the result of um, multiple grad students and postdocs in my lab a number of wonderful collaborators and field biologists uh, houndsmen who help us uh, uh, Collar the Mountain Lions, uh, pilot and illustrator, 
dozens and at this point really hundreds of undergraduate volunteers and a number of uh, funders and, and uh, amazing photographers. Um, so, you know, when we think about large predators, I think this is the, the kind of view that we, we normally have in mind. Um, you know, looking regal in their natural habitat, uh, these sort of amazing creatures. And more and more, the, the, the setting looks, you know, increasing like this, this, you know, leopard that's uh, surrounded by the city of Mumbai in India, a lion, African lion on the edge of Nairobi in Kenya, and then this sort of famous uh, mountain lion P-22 in Griffith Park in Los Angeles. And so as humans sort of spread out across the landscape, you know, we're becoming, we're coming more and more into contact uh, with these large carnivores, their habitat is disappearing, we affect them in other ways as well. And so our lab's focus is really trying to understand, you know, how these large carnivores uh, can make it and if they can make it in a, what's increasingly a human dominated world. Uh, today, I'm going to focus mostly on our work on, on mountain lions, since uh, that's what we, we have around here, and I'm sure most of you are interested in. So, um, sorry, I'm just a little technical difficulty here. Okay, so um, what you see here is is a is a picture of the Santa Cruz Mountains um, with the ocean to the to the you know west and south and uh, this big green block of habitat, which we call the Santa Cruz Mountains. And then it's separated from neighboring Diablo Range by the Highway 101 and all this you know, development, which is really the Silicon Valley. And so this creates what ecologists call the habitat fragmentation, where you know, once contiguous blocks of habitat are now fragmented and separated from each other by you know, mostly inhospitable landscape for whatever species you happen to be considering. And this is what I would call habitat fragmentation at the landscape scale, these sort of really big scales that, um, uh, you know, might cover hundreds of miles. And then, um, and then you can also have habitat fragmentation, what I call the home range scale, the scale of an individual animal, um, where, you know, right now we're looking at the UCSC campus with Santa Cruz uh, beyond it and the beautiful Monterey Bay after that. And so, you know, UC Santa Cruz is, is home to a couple of mountain lions at least, uh, not the only place that they call home, but as part of their home range. And you can see it's, you know, it's fragmented by roads and development and, and that sort of thing. And so this would be what we would call a home range scale habitat fragmentation. Um, and so, um, you know, fragmentation can have all these impacts. Here I show you Highway 17. It can, you know, sort of um, uh, create these sort of danger areas where animals trying to cross roads are susceptible to getting killed. Um, sometimes they don't get killed, but they just get injured, like this animal here, 16M, who was hit on Highway 17. And, uh, probably dragged along the road and it removed about a square foot of skin from his, his rear end. Miraculously, he recovered. And, um, and here you, you have a, a deer that we caught on another one of our trail cameras where the same thing has probably happened. This looks like you know, road rash. Uh, thankfully, the animal didn't get killed, but you know, sustained a pretty serious injury. Of course, not all animals are so lucky and many uh, get, get killed by vehicles on roads. Um, there's other sort of more nefarious impacts of habitat fragmentation. Um, here's a coyote and, and a bobcat um, that are within a few hundred meters of each other, one on the Santa Cruz uh, UCSC campus, the other in the Moore Creek Open Space Preserve. And these guys are suffering from mange, which is a, a disease caused by a little parasite, which is becoming increasingly common uh, throughout California and, and much of the much of the West um, due to the sort of widespread uses, uh, use of rodenticides uh, to kill rodents. And what happens is that the rodents don't die immediately. 
uh, they get consumed by these uh, larger carnivores. And then the carnivores don't die from uh, uh, the rodenticide itself, but it weakens their immune system and then they become susceptible to diseases like mange. Uh, another impact that fragmentation can have at these sort of large landscape scales is, is when you cut individuals off from neighboring populations, then uh, their genetics can get uh, increasingly uniform and this leads to uh, 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 a loss in genetic diversity, which can lead to genetic defects. Uh, here we're looking at the tail of a Florida panther, which is uh, a mountain lion that lives in the Everglades of Florida. It's cut off from other populations to the north and, and east or and west. And um, uh, these animals not only have a kinked tail like this, indicating the genetic defect, but they can have heart deformities and low sperm count. They can have malformed sperm and something called cryptocortism, which is when the testicles fail to descend. Uh, these are things obviously we want to avoid. And so, you know, our research is looking at all the different ways in which habitat fragmentation and the influence of humans on the landscape um, can impact people. Um, so, uh, So how do, how do we do our research? Well, um, first it entails doing quite a bit of, of reconnaissance where we set up trail cameras. Um, we figure out you know, how these animals are moving around and, and who's where. And when we uh, have a sense for, for what's going on and, and what the lay of the land might look like, um, we start uh, trying to, to catch these animals and put tracking collars on them. Uh, and we, we use a couple techniques to catch them. We use hound dogs where the animals, the, the hound dogs will, um, if all goes well, uh, find a fresh track, they'll follow that track until um, they bump the animal and they'll chase the mountain lion up into a tree, uh, at which point we come along and the animals uh, up in the tree, uh, seemingly they couldn't care less about the dogs. Occasionally they'll go to sleep with the dogs down at the base of the tree, barking up at them. Uh, when we come though, they tend to perk up and they care a bit, quite a bit more. Um, and we'll anesthetize them with a tranquilizer dart. Uh, we'll put on a tracking collar um, and an ear tag and we'll take uh, samples of um, their blood for genetics. We'll take a hair sample to uh, uh, look at stable isotopes, which gives us a sense for diet. Um, we'll weigh them and measure them. And, and then, you know, after about an hour, they, they wake up and, and they go on their merry way. And then we have this tracking collar on them, which allows us to see where they're going from a GPS. And then they also have an accelerometer on them as well, which we've calibrated to animals walking on treadmills so that just like your, your Fitbit, we can tell how many calories they're burning as they move through different kinds of landscapes. Okay, so people often ask me, you know, well, what do pumas eat? And uh, well, the simple answer is they eat deer. And here's a sort of stop motion animation showing uh, how this all works. Mountain lions or pumas are a ambush predator. And so, you know, it's, it's over quite quickly. They get, uh, you know, they, they ambush their prey. There's at most a, a few meters of chase and then uh, they'll drag it off into some bushes and, um, and eat it. And here you see a puma family. This is a female and her cubs that are you know, obviously uh, making use of that carcass. Um, the more complicated answer is that pumas eat a lot of things actually. Uh, here's uh, an example of, uh, uh, you know, I get these great sort of uh, video cameras from people with security systems that are you know, quite common these days. And so you see lots of fun stuff on them. So here's this, you know, well uh, instrumented house with the, showing the coyote chase. Here's a um, mountain lion uh, uh, possibly killing a, 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 a possum, although that opossum seems like one tough guy. And then coming up is a raccoon. Holy shit! Holy shit! Apologies for that the language there, but you know this was a holy that, uh, shit. 
Exactly. Now my cataract. Um, so they, you know, they do they do kill lots of other stuff. Uh, here's a little pie chart showing, you know, the kinds of things that they they kill. Um, you see, it's mostly deer, but they do kill a bunch of raccoons. They do kill a bunch of house cats. Uh, but you know, these are the types of things we found at their kill sites. Everything from beavers and bobcats and chickens and cows, uh, gopher snakes, goats. Um, they do like goats quite a bit, um, though they don't uh, kill too many goats because when they do kill goats, uh, they often get depredated, which is where the landowner uh, gets a permit from California Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, you know, legally shoots uh, the, the mountain lion. Um, the thing is though, is when you look at, th that's, that's, this is numbers, but if you look at it in terms of like how much meat or how many calories the animals are getting, it's almost all deer, right? Um, the reason the things like house cats and raccoons almost disappear, even though they're the second and third largest prey item or most common prey item is that there's just not much meat on one of those compared to a deer. And so when you look at it in terms of you know, calories, 95% of what they're consuming are, um, are deer. So then people often ask me, well, do mountain lions fear us? Do they, are they scared of us? Uh, you know, judging from this, uh, this set of images here, you might not might think, no, well, what's going on here? This is my uh, office on the UCSC campus. This is a, a GPS location from Mountain Lion 36M who appeared there one summer evening around 2 a.m. And this is me posing the next day with the deer that he had killed with my office right in the background. And then here he is coming back again to feed the next night. And so you might think, hey, not only does he not fear me, but maybe he's like, you know, uh, stalking me because I put this tracking collar around his neck. But, you know, we're scientists. And so we wanted to uh, look at this experimentally. And so we set up an experiment where we, um, we can find their kills from their GPS data. Um, and we go to those sites. And if we find a deer that they've killed, then we set up a, a apparatus that consists of a, a trail camera with video that's hooked up to a MP3 player that's hooked up to a speaker. And when the mountain lion comes back to feed, uh, the video starts recording and then the speaker either plays a control sound, which in our case was the sounds of frogs chirping or a treatment sound, which was the sounds of people talking. And then we could see what they did. And so here's an example of that. So here's a mountain lion at a deer kill, it's raining. And then those are the frogs. There he is sort of tugging on the tail. Doesn't seem to be too concerned about the frogs. And then pretty soon here, we're going to show the difference with people. So here the animal is with people uh, coming on the sound in just a second. This because the grand jury rendered a correct verdict. And so what you can see here is that the, uh, the uh, mountain lion, sorry, I just need a second. Sorry about that. Uh, I am giving this talk from my living room and uh, that was someone in the family's phone going off. So I am back. And uh, what you could see here is that, you know, obviously the mountain lion didn't kill too, care too much about the frogs, but when it heard the humans uh, speaking, all of a sudden it just took off, right? And um, that was pretty much what we saw across the board. Um, you might have recognized the uh, sound of the person talking is that of Rush Limbaugh. And um, we, uh, we played partisans on both the left and the right and uh, nonpartisan humans, uh, women and men. And uh, mountain lions really had 
uh, no sort of not, they were totally nonpartisan in their fear of humans. They basically ran away from, from every human voice or almost every human voice. Um, so here's what the data looked like. Uh, if you look at this panel on the left, this is fled upon first hearing the percent of trials, uh, almost never flee when they hear frogs, almost always flee when they hear humans. And then the ecological effect is that they, they take longer to come back when they've heard humans than when they hear frogs. And that translates into them feeding for fewer minutes at carcasses where they've heard humans than where they've heard frogs. And that scales up to affect their kill rates. So what you're looking at here in panel A are the uh, kill sites of, you know, hundreds of kill sites of a number of different mountain lions. And then in panel B, we're sort of just comparing two kill sites. At kill site one, uh, the animal is sort of in the, con is much closer to human development. These gray dots are the sites of human houses. And so, you know, it's, it's something that might look like this. And then um, at kill site two, the animal is, you know, kind of out in the middle of nowhere, no humans around, you know, uh, and at a site that my husband's been feeding. And so what you see in panel C and D here are the difference in feeding patterns. What happens when they kill close to people is that during the day, they move a few hundred meters away and rest in, you know, in the trees. And then they come back at the wee hours of the night, you know, 11, 12, 2 a.m., that kind of thing. And then uh, the difference being at these sites in more remote areas is that they basically just stay at the kill site you know, all day and night feeding on and off. And the effect is, is that they eat about twice as much at kills that are remote than they do at kills that are close to people. And so the impact of that is that animals that have more housing in their home range, so more uh, higher housing density have to kill, you know, up to 50% more deer a year. So if you look at puma females that live, you know, with virtually no human, uh, presence or human development, they're killing about 50 deer a year and pumas that are living closer to people are killing, you know, upwards of 75 deer a year because they have to, um, because they get less from each deer. All right, so then what happens if people are in the forest? You know, what, what happens if instead of being at a kill site, people are just sort of hanging out in the forest, maybe going for a hike or a bike ride or whatever. How does that affect animal behavior? And so to test this out, we, we performed an experiment where we set up one kilometer grids of speakers playing human or control sounds at two sites, one on the um, you know, east, west side of the Santa Cruz Mountains and one on the east side of the Santa Cruz Mountains. These were both areas that were um, close to humans so that we could sort of control the human presence. And then we played um, uh, the sounds of either people talking for a month and then frogs talking for a month or the opposite, frogs first and then people. Um, at 25 speakers spaced 200 meters apart. Um, and then we also set up cameras throughout the forest to, uh, to see what all the carnivores were doing. Um, we collared every mountain lion that used these two grid cells and had their collars sampling every, a location every five minutes so we could see how they responded. Um, and then we set up uh, uh, trapping stations for small mammals to see how the small mammals uh, responded. And this is, this is what we found. If, if um, this is like what our grid looked like with the uh, different speaker placements. And then uh, this is just one example where uh, a mountain lion moves through during the control and you can see it sort of moves through and, and does its thing. And then when there were humans playing, then you, the, the mountain lion gets close and then is like, oh, maybe I'll go around and does that. And so, this was indicative of what the data revealed, which was that um, when the humans are playing in the, uh, the forest, their 
you know, twice as likely to avoid it as they are when frogs are playing or the control sound. And if they do go through, then they move much more cautiously through the forest than they do if the frogs are playing. Um, and then the next thing we found was that um, we looked at, at, at uh, smaller carnivores to see how they behave. And we had two different ideas about, you know, what might, that might look like. We, we, we expected that maybe these smaller carnivores that mountain lions do kill might be very happy that mountain lions aren't there and increase their, um, you know, their presence or activity. Um, or the alternative hypothesis would be that, you know, these smaller carnivores are actually way more afraid of humans than they are of mountain lions. Um, because previous work by um, former postdoc of mine, Chris Derriman, has shown that humans kill these guys at rates four to nine times that of other predators. And it was that latter hypothesis that we, we found that basically all these other carnivores made themselves more scarce when humans were around. So bobcats reduced their, uh, their diurnal activity and became more nocturnal. Skunks just reduced their activity at all. And possums became uh, less efficient in their foraging. And then we looked at the small mammals, um, which you might expect that if these uh, carnivores are making themselves scarce, maybe the rodents are going to have a field day. And indeed, that's what we did find. Uh, we found that um, deer mice um, doubled their home range use or home range area, and uh, both um, deer mice and uh, wood rats. Um, increase the intensity with which they foraged on the landscape. And so if we think about how this would look, um, just sort of visually, here's a little cartoon showing, you know, uh, no people in the forest and you have your uh, carnivores out and about and your rodents kind of laying low. And conversely, when you have people in the forest, even if they're just talking to each other, then the carnivores make themselves scarce and the rodents have a field day and, um, you know, uh, become much more active throughout the forest. Um, so how does this fear influence where these animals go? Well, um, what you're looking at here is, is a, uh, a picture of a number of different mountain lions in the Santa Cruz Mountains. This picture is basically showing the Santa Cruz Mountains. Here's Santa Cruz, highest 17 runs up here to Los Gatos, San Jose, right? So each one of these colors is a different mountain lion and each one of the dots is like a, a location of that mountain lion on a particular day. And so you can see, you know, these mountain lions have fairly big home ranges. Um, and they're pretty much everywhere where you see green, right? So if you are in the Santa Cruz Mountains and you are in natural vegetation that's like outside of a city and there's enough cover to hide a mountain lion, then mountain lions have probably been there at one point or another. Now that's not to say that they're everywhere all the time. Uh, mountain lions are, are super uh, scarce on the landscape. There's probably only you know, 50 to 60 mountain lions in the entire Santa Cruz Mountains. So there's that. Um, and then they also uh, uh, are, you know, scarce in their use of habitat. They, they also are well hidden in their use of habitat. So here is a mountain lion moving around um, the west side of Santa Cruz. If this is Western Avenue right here. This is the base of UCSC campus. This is Moore Creek. And so what you see here is that this mountain lion is almost always under the cover of, you know, trees or, you know, coyote brush. Um, and um, so, you know, they're, they, they need cover. They're not gonna go out into the open meadows, even at night. Um, and they will, um, they will explore the urban fringe, particularly when there is a uh, habitat there. And so we've had mountain lions go on the other side of Western Avenue and they've killed raccoons and deer in this little area here. Uh, here's Mount Lion, a mountain lion on the UCSC campus. Now, you know, just, just to be clear here, this makes it look like 
mountain, there's a whole ton of mountain lions here all the time. This is one animal over the course of like two or three years. So this represents, you know, maybe three visits, each lasting less than a few hours over a two year period. So this is not, this shouldn't give the uh, uh, picture that mountain lions are just all over the UCSC campus. They do use all the forested parts of the UCSC campus, but on any given day, it is highly unlikely that there is a mountain lion on campus. Um, and so then uh, here's a mountain lion um, uh, making its way over to Highway 85 um, through, you know, Los Gatos, or I'm not sure if this transitions to a different town over here. Um, you know, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, maybe I went down a creek and got it over there. And when you look closer, no, it didn't go down a creek. It just um, went through neighborhoods. It got to Highway 85, where there's this big sort of 20 foot tall concrete wall. It spent the day either underneath this person's boat or underneath this tree. And then the next day it came back to open space and no one ever saw it or reported it or anything. Um, here's another example where um, you can see our collar arriving from Germany. It comes to Santa, Germany, it comes to Santa Cruz. And then we go put it on an animal uh, living close to Big Basin, uh, San Vicente Redwoods area. And um, it's with its mom for a couple months after we collared it. And then it made out on its own. And this is a phase of mountain lion life called dispersal when uh, commonly young males leave their mom and go out and try to find a territory of their own. Uh, females do it too, but they tend to uh, not travel quite as far as males. So um, here he is walking across the Santa Cruz mountains. Uh, he gets to 280 and decides to check out the other side. He gets to the Los Altos Hills, decides it's not urban enough, and goes into downtown uh, Mountain View. Uh, he gets to this corner at about 5 a.m. in the morning. His light starts coming up, uh, activity starts building, and he shoots across the street and hangs out underneath the bush next to this apartment building for most of the rest of the day. And here's the picture of the bush that he was hiding behind. Uh, and then at around, you know, five or six o'clock in the afternoon, he makes a dash for it. Uh, he heads over here. Uh, apparently there were now helicopters and police <laughs> uh, coming to the area to help out. And he eventually gets chased into this covered parking garage, which they were able to close with the gate. Um, and uh, Mountain View police, you know, they're creatures of the Silicon Valley. And so what do they do? Well, they start tweeting about it. And um, this, this happened right after a state law changed to uh, mandate that local law enforcement and Fish and Wildlife Service uh, try to non-lethally remove mountain lions from urban settings when they occur. And um, because the law had just been signed, um, the local law enforcement and fish and wildlife didn't have the expertise to, you know, non-lethally remove a mountain lion. So they wanted to get us in touch with us to see if we could help them do that. And so instead of giving me a call or sending me an email, which is the way I'm accustomed to communicating, uh, they tweeted at me, uh, at Santa Cruz Pumas, trying to reach you. Can you DM us? Uh, we have a collar mountain lion that may be related to your work. Now, thankfully, they found my phone number somewhere or email, gave me a call, um, and we were able to help out. And then they did a very, very interesting thing. Uh, they created a hashtag, uh, MV Puma, uh, shelter in place until we give you the all clear. Thank you, hashtag MV Puma. And so now other people could start sort of communicating about the event. And they did almost right away. Julia Vasquez wrote sheltered in place and we have a hashtag, exciting night in the Silicon Valley. And then Nancy Rossidi writes helicopter looking for a mountain lion in our neighborhood. So you can get a feel for, you know, start to get a feel for what's going on there. 
And so this was the scene when we arrived um, a few hours later. Uh, this is the, the parking garage that uh, the police had uh, uh, trapped the mount, mount lion in. Um, thankfully, they kept the crowd away from there. And, uh, and then Raj Matai uh, writes or tweets, mountain lion spotted in Mountain View, uh, Mountain View PD with guns drawn, tranquilizers near Rangsdorf in California. Um, and then, uh, and then um, this is a picture of the, the mountain lion here. And Track Dang writes, uh, Mountain View PD cornered MV Puma beneath a car in an apartment complex. That's my complex. And it's probably my car. And then, wouldn't you know it, but this mountain lion uh, pops up on Twitter with its own uh, Twitter handle and writes, this game warden guy has a weird gun looking, weird looking gun. Uh, why do you think I'm under the car? Um, you guys, they've got me surrounded. So in any case, we were able to, um, with the help of the local law enforcement, we were able to safely anesthetize the animal and get it loaded up into the back of our truck. And then we had a four car siren escort back up into the mountains. We felt very important. And um, we were able to, you know, safely release uh, the animal on a um, uh, uh, remote camera a few days later. And he's back on Twitter, glad to be out in the open spaces and soft hills. That city concrete is murder on the pause. Humans call me 46M, but my friends call me Rory. Um, we should use the MV Puma hashtag to organize a block party. This is the most contact I've ever had with neighbors. Um, so, you know, fun night in the Silicon Valley. Um, glad we were able to, you know, safely uh, translocate the animal back to open space. Um, but, you know, ideally this is, this is not the way things play out for mountain lions. Um, but what's happening is that, you know, um, as these habitats are becoming more fragmented, it's becoming harder and harder for animals to find adjacent habitats to move into. And in fact, um, a genetic analysis that we recently uh, performed with collaborators um, shows that, um, you know, this is starting to create problems for mountain lions. And so what you're seeing here, um, is you know the state of California, these white dots are genetic samples of mountain lions from across the state. And the different colors are showing areas where mountain lions are sort of uh, you know, effectively breeding with each other within those color blocks, but not breeding with each other across color blocks. And so this is a problem because this is, um, you know, mountain lions really should be you know, breeding with each other across color blocks. And the reason they're not is because of roads and development in between that's blocking their passage from doing so. And so we can look at the genetic health of these animals by looking at what's called the effective population size. And previous research has shown that you need a critical effective population size of 500 to 1,000 to maintain sort of viable populations uh, into the future. And if you look at the um, uh, Santa Cruz Mountains area, that's the central coast north, uh, you know, we've got uh, effective population size of about 16. Uh, it gets even worse if you look at the uh, Santa Monica Mountains, which is the central coast south, they've got effective population size of only about 2.7 animals. Um, and so genetically, things are not looking great. Uh, for, for mountain lions, especially uh, from uh, San Francisco along the coast range to the Mexican border. This is the area where the genetics really illustrates that these animals are, are imperiled. And it's on the basis of this paper that the Department of Fish and Wildlife is currently uh, uh, evaluating mountain lions uh, for state threatened status. So ideally, um, we would make these habitats uh, or these, uh, uh, yeah, habitats more permeable to movement by animals so that they can get from one of these areas to the next. And so that's uh, one of our objectives has been looking at 
you know, the connectivity of the landscape. In particular, we're focused on these purple areas, which are Highway 17, so they can get back and forth between the east and west side of the Santa Cruz Mountains, and then the Coyote Valley, so the animals can get to the Diablo Range and back, and then the area in Aroma, so the animals can get from the Gabilan Mountains to the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, uh, so based on our work, uh, uh, there's a very exciting project happening at the Laurel Curve, which I think is uh, close to breaking ground um, that's going to be putting a tunnel underneath um, the Laurel Curve. Um, and the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County has uh, preserved land on both sides to you know, provide safe passage. And so you know, I think that's going to do a lot for connectivity in the Santa Cruz Mountains. There's a similar project uh, being conducted by the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, uh, close to the spillway of the Lexington Reservoir. That's uh, not quite as far along, but also uh, shows a lot of promise. And then, if we look at the Coyote Valley, our our thought was, well, if we collar a bunch of um, young males, uh, then they'll show us where they cross and if they cross and that kind of thing because they travel long distances and so we did that and you can see these animals are traveling long distances they're traveling all throughout the Santa Cruz mountain um, this one doesn't show it but we even had an animal go up to the San Francisco Zoo recently um, but they're not getting out right they're trying to explore how to get out but they're not able to get out and um, so if we look at this area, that's the Coyote Valley where there's still sort of not a lot of development in between, but not quite good enough for mountain lions. Um, this is the showing the Southern area around the area of Aromas. And so we decided to uh, use another species and that is bobcats to sort of look at the plumbing for wildlife in even more detail. And what we did is we, we, we uh, collared a bunch about 40 or 50 bobcats with these um, collars that would sample at a very high frequency when they were moving and then sort of shut down when they weren't moving. And so we could get some very accurate uh, track data from these, mount, from these bobcats. And then this is a, a illustration of the Coyote Valley where um, these orange lines are the tracks of you know, 20 plus bobcats as they move back and forth across the Coyote Valley. This white line, heavy white line here is the Highway 101. And this darker line here is Monterey Highway. And so you can see the 101 in the Coyote Valley is, has some pretty good connectivity. They're able to move back and forth. These are uh, mostly culverts. And over here is a big bridge where Coyote Creek comes under. But this Monterey Highway is a real bottleneck. There's um, uh, only one place where they are sometimes able to successfully cross. We often, we also find a lot of roadkill there. And so uh, um, it's not great, but um, the city of San Jose and uh, Peninsula Open Space Trust or POST uh, have been, have bought a bunch of land right here. And the long-term plan is to revegetate that with appropriate um, native vegetation and, uh, you know, punch a couple more holes through the road so that there's better passage for wildlife in this area. And then finally, the area around Aromas, um, uh, this is where the Santa Cruz Mountains in the south meet the Gabilan Range. And here um, we had one animal try to cross, it got all the way to the 101, where it says 156 here, that's really Highway 101, and it just didn't cross. What we think happened, is the collar went dead right here. We're pretty sure what happened is it got hit by a car and that destroyed the collar. Um, so again here, uh, we have this one mountain lion to, to get an even better sample size and look at the plumbing more. We, we colored bobcats, and each one of these colors is a different bobcat. Uh, this guy down here is actually a gray fox. And what you can see is that the wildlife in this area are completely hemmed in by 101. And so um, uh, since we did this study that 
Uh, Land Trust of Santa Cruz County has bought a property called the Rocks Ranch, which is just to the south here, um, and are now working with Caltrans to try to um, you know, build an underpass or overpass for safe passage of wildlife uh, across the 101. Um, so last, I just wanna uh, talk briefly about where pumas die. Um, and uh, over the course of the study, we've had a, a number of our animals uh, uh, die. Um, this is uh, data as of a couple of years ago, we've had more mortality since then. But this gives you a sense for you know, what the causes of mortality are. The, the biggest cause of mortality are, are what we call depredation, which is where animals, like I said at the beginning of the talk, get in trouble for killing goats and are depredated by the landowner. Uh, then there's um, vehicle collisions. Some are unknown. You know, we just we, we, we find a dead animal and we can't figure out how it died. Um, uh, and then there's uh, vehicle collisions, there's uh, puma on puma killing, there's disease, and then there's illegal killing. Um, and you, so you can see that, you know, the, um, of the things we know about the human cause depredations and vehicle collisions are, are, um, are by far the, the largest causes. And um, the places where pumas die, the actual, locations where they die are almost never in these sort of more remote areas um, and almost always in what we call the wildland urban interface and the wildland urban interface is where um, uh, you know houses and natural vegetation are intermixed and it can be places that look like this where the you know the 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 vegetation and the houses are, are mixed up together or it can be places that look more like this where the the, the houses come up and, and hit the, the, the open space or natural vegetation. Either way, these are places where, you know, uh, mountain lions um, uh, almost always, uh, the place where there's the most mortality of mountain lions. And increasingly, um, and you know, that's either by getting hit by the road or, or, or depredation or, um, uh, uh, possibly some other causes. And increasingly people are, are realizing that it, these wildland inter, uh, urban interfaces are um, you know, not great for climate change as it causes people to have to commute much longer in vehicles. Uh, it uh, takes a lot more energy to heat a single family home than an apartment building. And they're also the sites of um, you know, sources of ignition for wildfires, and they also make wildfires uh, born, burn more intensely. And so, you know, uh, people are starting to realize that, um, you know, if we want to uh, maintain habitat for wildlife, we want to reverse climate change, and we want to mitigate the severity and intensity of the fires that we're having, we're going to have to think differently about where we put new homes in California in the future. That's all I got for you. I'm uh, excited to take your questions. And um, really good. This one, this one. Yeah, would be visit us on our, our webpage if you get a chance. And otherwise, uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Wilmers. That was that was fascinating. I think to me personally, I spend a lot of time in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And um, I know I'm going to be playing a lot more Rush Limbaugh when I'm running. So thanks for the talk. Um, we have a bunch of questions here. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. And just a reminder, you can please uh, look through the questions and upvote those that you'd like to see, and we'll, we'll ask them again. And the question with the most upvotes right now is from Yiman. Has there been a collaboration with indigenous groups in working with the big cats and other wildlife? If so, can you say more about the collaboration? Yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, we've been um, working a bit with the um, Amamutsun Land Trust, um, most recently to in the uh, Aromas area where, um, uh, you know, we're very interested in um, 
wildlife connectivity. Uh, they're very interested in that area because, um, you know, there's a lot of cultural meaning for a number of different reasons. And so we've been putting our heads together a bit as to, you know, how we can more effectively manage and conserve that area. Thank you. We have a question from Lelu. I've often thought that the big cats in Santa Cruz that enter the Arana Gulch neighborhood have lost the battle for turf in the hills and are actually starving, desperate, and operating in a last resort survival mode. Any thoughts about this? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, um, So there's a few things that are true. Um, one is that pretty much any age and um, uh, sort of toughness of mountain lion will come into, uh, sorry, the Arana Gulch, uh, I'm, I'm, Arana Gulch is like uh, at the edge of the city of Santa Cruz or is like full on in the middle of Santa Cruz? Can you help me with the geography there a bit? Or maybe I'll just Google it really quickly. Sorry, <laughs> just wanna make sure I know the geography you were talking about here. Okay, yeah, so, uh, at least what I'm seeing from quick Google is Arana Gulch is kind of more like, you know, at the edge of town and um, pretty much any age class and um, sort of fitness or whatever you want to call it of mountain lion will come into a place like Arana Gulch. It just, it just depends on where they set up their home range. If, if someone's setting up their home range that has a border that's the city, you know, they'll come to the edge of the city and, and check it out. So there is that, and that, that is true. Um, but then there's also the fact that like um, young males uh, and sort of animals that maybe haven't quite established themselves or are senescing, they're on the other side of that and they're kind of, you know, washed up for lack of a, a better term. Um, they'll, they'll make their living at the edge of, more established uh, mountain lion home ranges. And so what we see with young males, for instance, is that you know, they're kind of often starting at one of these edges where there's less likely to be conflict from established males. And then as they sort of slowly grow and get stronger, they'll expand and push out into the established male's home range. So, I would say that that comment is true, but there's lots of other reasons to be in a place like Arana Gulch and other animals that use those places. Thank you. We have, a, we have another question from uh, Yiman. If, if mountain lions are already so scarce, well, I think we, yeah, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest in your comments about depredation. Um, if mountain lions are already so scarce, uh, why are goat owners allowed to kill them if they hunt goats? Wouldn't it be sensible for the government to compensate the owners and leave the lions alone? Yeah, good question. So um, let's see, there's a lot of ways to answer that. So um, if um, even though um, mountain lions are um, they're the number one way they die is from goat owners in the Santa Cruz mountains. Um, I don't see it as a threat to the population. So the population uh, has enough numbers that it can withstand getting killed uh, for um, you know, killing goats and not sort of get wiped out in that way. Uh, the real threat to mountain lions in the Santa Cruz Mountains is the lack of connectivity to adjacent mountain ranges and um, 
the potential for sort of genetic spiraling. Um, we're already starting to see this in uh, Southern California. It might be happening here, but we haven't looked closely at it yet. And that is that if you take a sample of sperm from a mountain lion in the Santa Monica Mountains, something like 95% of those sperm are malformed and it should be way less than that. Um, and that's because of the loss of genetic diversity from inbreeding. We're getting, you know, close or potentially we're there in the Santa Cruz mountains. And so that's the, the, the real sort of long-term threat. Um, you know, other threats are, um, you know, the continued development of these remote areas uh, into, um, you know, homes and roads and that kind of thing. Um, in places like the Santa Cruz Mountains, Santa Monica Mountains to the south, where you have fewer animals, then the depredation does become a much bigger deal and can threaten uh, local populations. And so um, uh, with this sort of temporary threatened status, which may become permanent, um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife has changed the depredation um, rules so that an animal has to kill your groats three times uh, before it can be depredated. And so since that rule went into effect a little over a year ago, uh, there haven't been, been any depredations. Diaz, what data is used to determine the tunnel locations? How would a puma know where a tunnel is? And is a tunnel better than an overpass bridge? Yeah, more great questions. So the tunnel locations were determined from a combination of where our animals were actually crossing uh, to where uh, what we call connectivity models we built were predicting they should cross. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's always nice when your models agree with your raw data. And so, you know, that was pretty good evidence that those were good locations for tunnels. So, you know, not every tunnel, every animal in the Santa Cruz mountains is gonna find that tunnel, but enough will that you'll get uh, transportation of genetic material from one side to the other. And what you hope is that an animal that was, you know, born on one side of the tunnel breeds with an animal that was born on the other side of the tunnel and makes a baby that continues to procreate. And that's how genetic information is spread and genetic diversity increases. Um, now, in terms of, so, so not every animal will find the tunnel, but the animals that do live somewhere nearby should be able to find the tunnel because in addition to the tunnel, there'll be what's called directional fencing on either side of the freeway for at least a mile or two that um, uh, directs the animal to the tunnel. You know, animals hit a fence, they could jump over it, but they're lazy. And so they're just gonna walk along it until they find a way around. And that way around will be the tunnel. So um, William comments that uh, <clears throat> uh, he saw some large wild pigs while hiking in Henry Bear by Cody Lake. And he met someone who has uh, seven acres and said that they're breeding and now a nuisance. Are these breeding and spreading out from somewhere and what impact will these large prey have on mountain lions? So wild pigs. Yeah, so, so wild pigs are, um, they're, you know, kind of all over California. I mean, not everywhere, but um, in the more temperate parts of California. And, um, you know, they're a nuisance. They, uh, they are an invasive species that can do a lot of damage. Um, they're not great for the ecosystem. In places like the Santa Cruz Mountains, there's been quite a bit of pig control. So in many parts of the Santa Cruz Mountains, there just aren't that many. There were uh, 15, 20 years ago, there were way more pigs here than there are now. 
Um, I think they're controlled less in uh, the, on the east side of Highway 101 than they probably are here. Um, mountain lions uh, seem to prey on pigs a little bit, but not that much. Uh, when they've killed pigs, we see them kill the piglets. Um, but you know, uh, full-grown pigs are pretty, pretty large animal. Um, and when mountain lions have, you know, so many deer to go for, I don't think uh, full-grown pig is uh, um, too appealing. Interesting. Leonard asks, how big a threat a mountain lion is for a solo backpacker? Well, can a mountain lion kill you? Yes. Will a mountain lion kill you? Uh, almost definitely not. I mean, the statistics, um, uh, you know, I would be, so <laughs> uh, there, there's this magazine, Harper's Magazine, right? I'm, I'm not sure if it still exists or not, but it had this like page at the front that would have these like pages of statistics. And I remember when I was a kid reading one, it was like, you know, uh, number of people who impale themselves on a toothbrush and die each year in the United <laughs> States. And it was like a number like 11. Um, and so, you know, I take it from that statistic that you're more likely to impale yourself on your toothbrush than you are to get killed by a mountain lion, right? Because, you know, in the history of California, there's been something like, I don't know, 16 or 17 attacks and something like you know, eight of those resulted in, you know, the person dying and two of those were because of like rabies and my numbers might be off by one or two or three. So, you know, um, don't quote me exactly on that. But, you know, the, the odds of getting attacked and killed by a mountain lion, uh, even if you're like right in the middle of mountain lion habitat and you're alone and all that are super, super low. Um, you know, that being said, there are things that you can do to like uh, make yourself even safer. Uh, you can you can hike with you know a partner. Uh, you can make noise. Um, there are those things that you can do. Um, that said, um, there was a study out of UC Davis a few years ago that looked at all the attacks of mountain lions on people across the West, um, and they looked at you know, who the mountain lion was, was it a male, a female, a young, old? Uh, they looked at who the person was, were they like um, young, old, male, female? Uh, and they looked at what the person did when the mountain lion attacked and then whether the mountain lion killed the, the person or not. And what they found was that, you know, if you, well, first they found no pattern, that it, it wasn't like, you know, just young mountain lions attack humans. There, or that just women get attacked or just men get attacked. There was no real pattern like that. And then um, if you do get attacked um, and, you, um, and you run, uh, then you're less likely, sorry, if you encounter a mountain lion and you run, you're less likely to get attacked. But if you do get attacked, you're more likely to get killed. Um, and so, you know, um, not, not, not really sort of helpful, I don't think, in terms of uh, uh, what your approach should be. But um, uh, it just goes to show it's, it's a super random thing uh, and also super, super rare. Uh, I'm noticing uh, a few comments in the Q&A from people who've had some experiences. It would be fun to read these. Um, uh, Nanda said that we had, we had a mountain lion sighting three months ago in La Selva Beach, right off San Andreas in a neighborhood backyard, uh, or neighbor's backyard. We saw the cat when she stepped out of her yard, uh, and he saw her and just floated over a six-foot fence. Um, let's see, uh, Carlisle said that we live at the top of Arana Gulch drainage and have twice seen moms with multiple cubs. And uh, Margaret says that uh, at the Son Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, where she's a docent, 
Our mountain lion club Cruz was found as a sick cub in the backyard near San Jose. We think we know what happened to its mother. Um, so a lot, I think a lot of interest in the topic and some fun personal stories. Um, now I have a, I have a question from, uh, from Lee. Uh, can you speak to the impact of the past year's fires on large predators? Yeah, good question. Um, we don't uh, we don't have really direct data to bear on like the CZU fire and how it impacted the mountain lion population. We had we had three collared animals that were just at the edge of it, um, and you know they sort of moved over and out of the way of the fire, and then after the fire, they sort of have been, you know explored going back in there a little bit and the, no, no sort of like, oh, wow, look at that. Um, that's interesting kind of patterns. Um, you know, the CZU fire was big enough and quick enough. You know, I think it burned about 40 or 50,000 acres in a 24 hour period that I'm sure there were some mountain lions in there that were not able to make it out and, and would have died. Um, um, and then, you know, what generally happens in, in any kind of fire situation is that as the vegetation grows back and the deer come back in, then the mountain lion will, will be close behind. Um, so um, I would imagine that there's, well, there, there, are, there is less use of the areas that burn now, but within a few years, uh, you know, they'll be uh, heavy use again. Patricia notes that you and other researchers are catching a fair number of mountain lions regularly. Why not actually translocate some of the, some number of young males to alleviate the inbreeding problem, at least for now, until connectivity can be improved? Um, it's certainly a possibility. Um, it would, uh, you know, take a lot of uh, political will and um, and uh, and you know money to do that. Um, it would be an ongoing thing that would have to be a sort of constant effort. It's not like you can do it one one and done. This would have to be, you know continued over and over and over again on a yearly basis. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, for one, would rather see the efforts made to restore connectivity than to, you know, move animals around on the landscape. Um, yeah, thank you. A question from Faye. What is your take on the approval of using rodenticide on the Farallon Islands to eradicate mice and rats? Um, yeah, good question. I think, I think it's probably a pretty good idea because um, the mice and rats are, you know, I guess I don't, I don't know the, uh, the, the situation all that well, um, but, uh, I do know that mice and rats are, you know, have devastating impacts on uh, nesting marine birds and um, uh, probably a lot more of an impact than uh, rodenticide would. Uh, there's no mountain lions there to worry about. Um, and so, you know, where these strategies have been used uh, elsewhere in the world on islands to eradicate mice and rats, they've been, you know, very successful at recovering um, uh, uh, nesting bird populations. Zoe wonders if you've been able to tell whether or not pumas in more human populated areas have gotten used to the presence of humans. Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, I guess, you know, that that's uh, what the questioners bringing up is like, 
you know, the question of whether mountain lions or pumas get habituated to people. And um, we're not sure about that, but we're in the process of studying it um, over the hill in a park called Rancho San Antonio, which is a mid pen park. Um, it's great mountain lion habitat and it's also an incredibly busy park. And so, um, and they've had a couple of mountain lion attacks there over the last few years. And so, you know, one of the questions or hypotheses for why that might be happening is that um, mountain lions are becoming habituated to people, losing that fear and then uh, attacking. And so we're trying to understand that. And then based on our understanding, develop strategies to try to you know, mitigate that issue. I have, a, I have a question from Carlisle. You may, you may have just answered this, so let me know if I can move on. Uh, is there a proposal to transfer males between isolated populations? No. Um, so I have a second question from Carlisle. Why aren't the populations on the east and west sides of the Sierras crossbreeding? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, there's, uh, um, you know, some pretty high mountains and a lot of snow in the winter. And so um, some of these uh, mountain lion populations in the Sierras are migratory. So, um, you know, they migrate up to higher ground as the deer do in the summer, and then they go back down to lower elevations uh, in the winter. And so, um, you know, my guess would be that um, they're, they're mostly, you know, breeding and, and having offspring on those winter ranges uh, and not so much on the summer ranges where they might be more likely to overlap with an animal from the other side of the Sierra. But that's just total conjecture. That's a great question that I don't have a good answer, uh, any a, a real answer to. Mehran uh, asks uh, whether you've looked at all at the response of deer, the main prey of mountain lions, to the presence or noise of humans. Yeah, good question. Um, let's see. In our um, in our grid experiment. Um, we did look at deer, um, and I don't think that deer showed any um, any real strong response to humans. Um, we've looked at deer in other ways. Um, on a sort of fine scale, there does seem to be like what we would call a human shield effect, and that is that you know if you walk away from human development. Um, you know, you're more likely to find deer like 150 meters from people than you are 300 meters away from them. Um, and the same deer will move back and forth between those areas, but they're more likely to spend time closer to people. Um, and we think that's uh, possible, but we think that's because of, you know, this human shield effect where mountain lions are kind of afraid of people. Uh, so the deer kind of come closer to people. Um, but it's, it's even more complicated than that. But uh, that's a sort of good short answer. Uh, question from, from Darren. Um, I think there's some, some concern about your, your experiment. Uh, what happens when the dogs are used to tree a mountain lion mother with cubs, are there ever accidents like the, the cubs being captured by the dogs, for example? Yeah, so we don't run dogs on mountain lions that have young cubs. What is your, what is your overall outlook for the future of these animals? This is from Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I think a really um, 
depends on how we continue to develop California. If we continue to spread out into open space, um, you know, not too good. Um, if we kind of cap the uh, development in sort of open space areas, sort of roughly where it is now and focus future development and infill sites and in cities, then you know, I think they're gonna do just fine. Um, there's, you know, lots of things that need to be improved like connectivity and poisons and depredation policies and things like that. But those are, those are all manageable challenges. Um, the ever increasing spread of human development into open space though is a deal killer. Oh, now, um, I think we, we have a lot of potential activists and, and families watching tonight. Larissa asks, what, if anything, can individuals and families do to help the mountain lions? Yeah, great. So, good question. Um, let's see. I guess, um, you know, if you are like a, a goat owner or, you know, have friends who are goat owners, um, uh, encourage them to build um, uh, pens for them at night that are fully enclosed. So, you know, a lot of people who have goats, they have a fence to keep the goats in, but it doesn't keep the mountain lions out. Um, and that's where mountain lions get into trouble. Um, so if you can have, you know, a full fence with a roof and keep ant livestock in at night, um, it doesn't eliminate all the possible conflict because mountain lions will occasionally kill during the day when your animals would be out, but 95% of it. Um, and then sort of at a more, you know, um, more sort of regional and statewide level vote for policies that, you know, encourage uh, infill development and discourage sprawl. So we have, following up on that, we have uh, a couple of questions about communication to make people more aware of this issue. D asked, uh, is any of this wonder, wonderful research being offered to the human population in the Santa Cruz area? So there's a better understanding that we humans live in their habitat. And uh, then uh, Cheryl noted that, uh, the presence of mountain lions in large cities was made known in San Francisco on the Embarcadero last year. So any plans or thoughts on communication? Yeah, great question. So um, yeah, I, I agree it's communication is super important. And so, um, you know, we do a lot of uh, outreach. Uh, we give talks like this. Um, to larger groups, we get out into uh, different communities and give you know talks about our work to uh, community groups. Um, we've got a, a Facebook site and a website which uh, have information. Um, you know, we engage with reporters and the press. Uh, uh, when possible, um, we uh, often have, you know, folks from National Geographic or some kind of like uh, enterprise like that who are making a, a, a video or uh, uh, writing a story um, come out in the field with us. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of things that we do along those lines. And I think, in, in following up on that again, um, are there ways that the audience can support uh, your research? Uh, do you have a, do you do some fundraising or are there some uh, charities for people to donate to? Yeah, so um, we'll, we'll always graciously accept donations to our research. And then um, actually there's a new program that's been set up by the Wildlife Conservation Network. They're an NGO based in San Francisco. And I've uh, been helping them set up a 
California Wildlife Program that's going to focus initially on uh, connectivity for uh, mountain lions in the Central Coast. So uh, that would be another good source. So we can go to the Santa Cruz Puma Project website to donate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And that website is now up uh, on the chat box, so you should be able to find it there. One final question, Professor, uh, from Raul. Do you know what the trend is for deer populations, since these are the main food source for mountain lions? Is there going to be enough food for them in the next few decades? Oh, I wish I knew uh, more about the trends in deer populations. They are extremely difficult to count in our geography. Um, places where they do get counted are typically areas that you can uh, you know, fly a small aircraft and count them from the sky. Um, you can count them on a sort of uh, smaller scale using what are called genetic mark recapture techniques where you hike around and look for deer poop and figure out who's who from the genetics and you can count them that way, but it's not practical over the scale that mountain lions live. So, um, there's other techniques, but in a rugged forest and environment, they just don't work very well. So um, we thought a lot about how you might count deer. Uh, science has not yet uh, uh, given us a method that would work well in our study area. Um, that said, I'm not, I'm not too worried about the deer around here. Um, uh, you know, they seem to be, there seem to be plenty for mountain lions. Um, I'm not sure if they're increasing or decreasing um, what kind of dynamics they have, but there is there is a trend across the West, I would say, um, that has seen a decline in, um, in deer populations. And I think it's a much bigger deal uh, where you have migratory deer uh, in the Sierras and the Rocky Mountains and the Cascades. And it's these populations that again are becoming highly threatened by habitat fragmentation because uh, subdevelopment, subdivisions, roads impede their ability to migrate from winter ranges to summer ranges, and that's causing their populations to you know, uh, decline. So uh, the deer around here don't do that so much. They have small home ranges that they live in uh, for their whole lives. They're non-migratory. Um, there's uh, probably a lot of interesting things happening with their populations, but I don't expect it to become a problem for mountain lions in the, the near future. Well, unfortunately, uh, I think we're out of time. Uh, I'd wanna thank our wonderful audience for all of your questions and uh, for all of the upvoting, that really helps. Uh, I wish we could get to all of your questions, but uh, unfortunately we're out of time. Uh, so a big round of applause in the Q&A box. You can, you can type your thanks to Chris right there. So uh, Dr. Wimler, thank you so much. It's a fascinating talk. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, your insights and your research with us. Um, this talk has been recorded and it will be available on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel in a day or two. Again, we'll, we'll send that out on our thank you emails and social media channels. Um, thank you, everybody. And also a big round of thanks to the staff of the alumni and university events offices who helped us organize this webinar. Thank you to, to Diana, Kayla, Paulina, and Kristen. Thanks, Our next event on Monday, February 14th, um, Valentine's Day, will feature Professor Stefano Profumo, who will illuminate dark matter in the universe. He'll explain why this ingredient is needed to explain the observed universe as we observe it, describe what dark matter might consist of, and sketch the exciting hunt underway for stronger evidence. Stefano Profumo is a professor of physics, the director of physics graduate studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the deputy director for theory uh, of the Santa Cruz Institute, Institute for Particle Physics. Professor Stefano has published over 170 peer-reviewed articles that have been cited around 20,000 times. He's the author of the textbook, An Introduction to Particle Dark Matter. A few other upcoming, upcoming UCSC events that you might be interested in, on January 26th, Stacy Philpott will discuss pollinators and share her research from the past decade exploring how urban garden and landscape management influences pollinators. 
Also of interest for gardeners on February 9th, UCSC Center for Agroecology Research Lands Manager Daryl Wong will discuss how to assess and improve soil health in your vegetable beds. He'll describe recent relevant scientific findings and how to apply those concepts in practice. Just check events.ucsc.edu to find the full calendar of events. On behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you for joining us and please come back on February 14th, 6.30 p.m. for our next virtual event. Good night, everybody.